Hey everyone, my name is Corel, and today we're going to be taking a look at another From the Depths tutorial, this time on cram cannons. I apologize for the lateness of this tutorial. Uh, between the Christmas holidays and getting sick and losing my voice and having to do some emergency house repairs and all that fun sort of stuff, it, things have been a little chaotic lately and I haven't had time to get into this. Uh, plus, cram cannons are not my area of expertise, so I am fully expecting some of you guys to know more about this topic than I do. But all that aside, let's go ahead and get into cram cannons. So what exactly is a cram cannon? Well, they have several different themes going for them here. They've got really slow projectiles. They've got really slow rate of fire. They have some of the highest damage output in the game, especially when you talk about it in terms of resource efficiency. They've got extreme burst damage, so it will hit something really, really, really hard once every 20 seconds or so. Uh, they're very easy to fuse the shells, which gives them a fair degree of flexibility in how exactly you go about hitting a target. Uh, they're very bulky, as you can see here. They're also very heavy. There are a lot of components in the cram cannon section that weigh a lot, especially when you talk, start talking about large, heavy barrels. Uh, these components just weigh so much compared to everything else. Uh, it actually gets a little overwhelming. Uh, generally, they're also fairly damage resilient. This is a little bit down to how you build the cannon. There's a couple tricks that I will get into later uh, that will help you build these things to be able to resist damage. But compared to, say, an APS cannon where if it took a shot in the side over here, odds are the cannon would be completely out of commission. Uh, a cram cannon would be able to take a shot in the side it might lose some gauge, it might lose some reload efficiency, it might lose some of its stats, but it's going to keep on firing. You're not going to completely destroy the cannon with a single shell most of the time. Uh, you've also got, uh, generally, bigger is better with these things. That goes back to the bulky point. Uh, the larger you make a cram cannon, the more stuff you're going to be able to pack into each shell, and since it's firing slowly anyway, uh, at any sort of reasonable, uh, efficient, reasonably efficient cram cannon, it, packing more stuff into each shot is good. You're never really going to get away from that. All right, so uh, speaking of packing, that's one of the first concepts to talk about in terms of cram cannons. Cram cannons have a pack time associated with them. And what that pack time is, there's a minimum time that you need in order to actually fire a shell from the cram cannon and that's uh, modified by how many ammo containers you have on the cram cannon. But there's also a pack time on top of that, and you can define in a cram cannon's UI by hitting Q on the cram cannon, and in the cram cannon settings we can set a minimum pack time. What this is saying is we're going to wait at least this long between firing shells, and what that does is it forces the cram cannon to cram, that's the name, more of its actual uh, components uh, that is the explosives, the frag particles, the EMP, whatever you're throwing into this cram cannon shell, it's going to pack more of that into the shell over time. So the longer you wait, the more powerful your shell gets. Uh, that leads to some very interesting and honestly kind of surprising results when you start talking about the most efficient ways to use cram cannons, but we'll get into that in a bit. Uh, they also have another trick up their sleeve. They have a tiny bit of tracking when you fire them on a high arc. Most weapons uh, with uh, any sort of projectile or travel time associated with them will have uh, something like this um, uh, arc setting, where it uh, will pick only low, prefer low, prefer high, only high, or direct line. And these different aiming methods will tell the... Uh, basically whatever's aiming them, it could be the AI, it could be you manually, uh, it will tell whatever's aiming them to prefer a specific trajectory or only use a specific trajectory. Uh, direct line is the least useful of these because it literally points the gun straight at the enemy. That is going to miss 100% of the time with cram cannons unless your enemy is literally sitting at the end of the barrel. Don't use that. Uh, only low and prefer low will generally not be able to take advantage of the tracking because you only get that tracking when your cram cannon is fired on a high arc, but this prefer high and only high will let the cram cannon actually track its targets. Uh, it's a little weird seeing a shell float down from space and adjust its course on the way down, and it doesn't have a whole lot of tracking, 
but it does have some, and there are some advantages to that, especially when you're talking about hitting slow targets. All right, so moving on to our components list, we have a big old list here, but we're gonna move through this pretty quickly because there's a lot of similarities between these components. First off, we've got the firing piece. Uh, similar to most weaponry, the firing piece is basically your control block for the weapon. The barrel goes out one end, everything else attaches on pretty much any other side. Unlike the uh, APS cannons, uh, there aren't any specific sides of the firing piece that are important other than the front. You've also got six-way connectors. As with the APS, these just let you connect more components to the firing piece. Now, unlike advanced cannons, these six-way connectors are actually extremely useful. They're used in a lot of different ways for uh, basically tetrising your components together uh, due to the way auto loaders work with cram cannons. So we'll get into that in a bit, but let's go ahead and move on to our next component. We have gauge increasers. The gauge increasers are a basically a different list of visuals for the same component. All of these are exactly the same thing. They just have different and honestly kind of fancy appearances. So you can make your gauge increasers look like part of your hole if you want to. You can even decorate with them nicely. But uh, overall, every single gauge increaser component is exactly the same thing. So don't go too out of your way decorating if you're just going to be sticking this under your hole. Now, as with the advanced cannons, there's a limit to how many gauge increasers are useful. You want exactly 45 of these if you're going for a maximum gauge cannon. More than 45 is useless except as a damage resilience measure, and fewer than 45 will not get you to that critical uh, two meter shell uh, diameter. Now, getting up to two meters exactly is not the most important thing in the world. If you can't fit exactly 45 and you can only sit, fit, say, 40, you're all right. Uh, as you can see, based on the tool tip here, each subsequent gauge adds 95% of the gauge of the last one that you added. Now, that stacks up to a pretty severe sublinear, sublinear increase, so uh, probably the first... 30 to 35 of those that you add are the most important. And after that, things start dropping off pretty quickly. So uh, if you can't fit all 45 of these on there, don't worry about it, but do try to if you possibly can, because it makes everything else on the gun more efficient. And since these are relatively cheap compared to other components on the gun, especially these uh, uh, particle uh, or pellet boxes over here, uh, those are, well, and more firing pieces if you were just trying to duplicate the cannon over and over again. Uh, adding more gauge increasers to an existing cannon is usually more efficient than trying to increase the damage output of the cannon in other ways. So we've got a variety of barrels here. Uh, the regular barrel basically just add more accuracy to the gun. It also reduces the firing angle. Firing pieces come with a built-in 45 degree firing angle. The more barrels you add onto the end of that, the lower that will go. However, uh, motor-driven barrels exactly counter the loss of angle. So you've got a regular barrel that will reduce your firing angle by uh, some amount, and then you've got a motor-driven barrel that will increase it by exactly the same amount. So yeah, this, as you can see, will offset the decrease in firing angle of one of their barrels. It's right there in the tooltip. So what you want to do is intersperse barrels with motor-driven barrels. However, there's some very interesting points uh, related to how exactly that works that we'll get into in a uh, moment here. So uh, let's go ahead and go through the other barrel types really quick. We've got a recoil suppression barrel. This reduces the amount of recoil uh, that the gun will produce. The longer your barrel is, the more recoil you'll get out of this. You've also got a flash suppression barrel. This will give you some... Uh, it basically makes the gun more enjoyable to be around because it's not putting out these gigantic booms. It, debatably, that might actually make it less enjoyable to be around, depending on how much you like the giant explosions. But, uh, yeah, whatever your tastes are. Uh, this does... Uh, lower the recoil a tiny bit. It also lowers the muzzle velocity a tiny bit. It also drastically lowers the range that you can detect a cram shell from, and that's important if you want to keep your cram shell from getting shot down. However, cram shells have such high health 
that very often you want them to be detected. You want your enemy's lambs to start shooting at them uh, because lambs, by definition, will be able to shoot shells and it's the only thing that can shoot shells. Uh, very often a target vehicle will try and shoot down your cram shell. But these things have such absurdly high health, it's like 10,000 health, that you can very often drain an entire lamb system by firing a single cram shell at them. And you want to give plenty of time to drain out that lamb system so that your other munitions can hit. Your uh, APS rounds, your missiles, you want to be able to drain that uh, lamb system out entirely and have it just focus on this one gigantic thing that it's never even going to be able to shoot down. And after that, you follow up with the other munitions that will then be able to slip through very efficiently. So um, having a flash suppression barrel might actually be a negative in a lot of circumstances. Uh, weigh that against your own needs, but do so pretty carefully. You've also got an elevation barrel here. This basically acts like the elevation mantlet. And what this does, you want one of these on there and it will decrease the amount that the uh, turret can turn, and it will drastically increase the amount that the turret can raise, or rather not the turret, uh, the barrel in, its, in relationship to the firing piece. So with an elevation barrel on there, and again, you only need one, uh, you will be able to aim upwards a lot, uh, but you will not be able to aim side to side very much. Great if you have your cram cannon on a turret, terrible otherwise in most circumstances. Uh, so, yeah, use these with caution. Uh, definitely use them on turrets. Uh, be a little careful otherwise. You've also got a bomb chute here. This replaces all of these other components. If you're using a bomb chute, you are dedicating your uh, cram cannon to one very specific role. And it's actually a very good role, as we'll talk about later. So, the bomb chute is basically there to drop a shell. It will not fire it with any velocity, it will just drop it out of a vehicle. Uh, but it gives perfect accuracy, there is no recoil, and you have a huge azimuth and elevation, so you've got a lot of field of fire out of this. There's also no muzzle flash, there's no sound, so it can reduce the amount of, uh, or the ease of detection of the firing vehicle. Not that it really matters. By the time you get a bomber equipped with one of these things over the top of an enemy vehicle, odds are it's going to see you anyway. So the reduction in detection is debatably useful. Still, bomb shoots are great. Uh, definitely use those under certain circumstances. You've also got heavy barrels. These come in a start and regular and end component. These are identical in statistics. They are just there for decoration. Uh, well, rather, the differences between the three are just cosmetic, so you can use any one of these in any scenario. But uh, what these do is these are extremely durable compared to a normal barrel. They have uh, nearly three times the health, they've got ten extra armor, and they weigh five times as much, and they cost three times as much. Other than that, they do exactly the same thing as the regular barrels. However, there are no motor-driven barrel equivalents of the heavy barrels, so these motor-driven barrels, you want these because otherwise you can't aim your uh, barrel outside of straight ahead of the firing piece, but, well, if you've got a long enough barrel, it is, but the motor-driven barrels always present a weak point in the turret. That leads to a very specific turret design. Uh, let's go ahead and talk about that for a moment here. I have here a turret. Uh, this has, in fact, this turret is not ideally designed because I have a... Uh, pair of barrels here, and they are all regular barrels and pivot barrels. Now if I wanted to make this turret as durable as I possibly could, what I would do here is add, replace all of these barrels with heavy barrels. And remember how I said elevation barrels are great on turrets? Well, this is a turret, so let's stick an elevation barrel on there. Okay, so this basically just became a lot more durable. However, uh, it became a lot heavier too. So what I have to watch out for here is that as this turret turns, it's going to just absolutely uh, throw off all of the kinematics or the uh, movement mechanisms of the vehicle because I'm swinging around a giant weight on a stick, essentially. And it, that gets very hard to balance. 
So uh, you need to be a little careful how many of these heavy barrels you use and where you use them. If I had to make a recommendation, I would say use them as close to the firing piece as you can. There are several reasons for that. One being that the heavy barrel is by itself very durable, and the uh, cram firing piece is the only single component on the cram cannon that, if destroyed, completely negates your cram cannon. So the entire cost of your cram cannon is basically negated if this one block is destroyed, but that is the only weak point. Now normally you would pack in a bunch of armor around this, and that's great, but your barrel still presents a weak point in that armor because these barrels don't stack with armor, and they're also much weaker than armor. So the heavy barrels are extremely durable and will kind of negate that hole in the armoring, if you will. So that can be very useful and will basically greatly increase the durability of the system as a whole, even if you only have a couple of these close to the center of the turret. Now, as close to the center of the turret is about as good a spot as you can hope to place these because they that keeps them from being out at the end of the cannon. Uh, now, the further out you put the heavy barrels on this, the more effect they're going to have on your movement because, like I said, you're putting in a weight at the end of a stick uh, that's very hard to drive and balance a vehicle against. So again, yeah, just be very careful where you put these. Also, when you start talking about explosions, when you start talking about uh, kinetic damage, most of those types of damage are going to be aimed at your hull, not at your barrels. So if your hull is the target, uh, things are much more likely to hit near the turret than they are at the very end of the barrel. So having your most durable components centered towards the turret itself uh, will have a great effect at keeping the turret as a whole functional and ensuring that you get your durability where it matters most and then you can use your lighter and more fragile components out here where they're a lot less likely to be hit and knocked off. So uh, yeah, there's a lot of reasons to keep these heavy barrels back here. I would highly recommend that. Uh, you'll note that I put these, uh, it calls them pivot barrels here, but these are motor driven barrels. Uh, you'll note that I put these out at the end. That is because these are much less durable than these heavy barrels. And they're in fact about on par with the regular barrels. But uh, I also want about a one-to-one -one ratio of these pivot barrels to regular barrels. The further away from a one-to-one -one ratio I go, the less ability I have to move these in an arc. So, uh, yeah, that can be kind of annoying. Uh, you can, if you want to, add more elevation barrels here. I have not found that to be particularly useful. I just replaced a um, motor-driven barrel with an elevation barrel there and went from like 11.5 degrees azimuth and 45 degrees elevation to 5 and 33.75. That's actually decreasing both. That's not useful. So uh, yeah, one elevation barrel is usually enough. If you need more than that, go for more pivot barrels. So that is pretty much uh, every factor that goes into barrel design. After that, it's all about the ammo and autoloaders. All right, so let's take a look at our uh, pellet boxes here. First off, we have frag pellets. This creates a cloud of frag particles. Uh, you cannot control the angle that these frag particles are spawned at. Uh, that is one thing that you cannot do with cram cannons at all. And unless you're using uh, pre-detonated cram shells or cram shells that detonate directly on armor, uh, rather than having a penetration depth fuse, then frag pellets are probably your best bet because of that. You've also got hardener pellets. These add more armor piercing. You've got HE pellets. These add more explosive damage and explosive radius. And you've got EMP pellets. These add more EMP damage. Now, you can just directly attach all of these to six-way connectors and the ammo boxes for that matter. Uh, you can attach any of those components directly to six-way connectors and they will operate. However, they operate much better when you connect them to autoloaders. Now, autoloaders, are a little different than how the advanced cannon autoloaders work. Each of these has three connection points and they can share boxes between them. So what we've got here uh, is a very nice little system where I have a column of connectors, I've got a column of autoloaders, and then I've got a column of boxes. 
And over here, again, I've got a column of connectors, autoloaders, and boxes. Both of these autoloaders are connected to this full column of boxes. However, that also created another little nook in here where I've got another column of boxes and pellets. You'll also notice that I've spread these ammo boxes out. Ammo boxes can chain detonate if they're adjacent to each other. However, they don't have enough explosive damage that they will chain detonate if you place a pellet box between them, and none of these other pellet boxes are explosive. So uh, spread these out. If you spread these out, you will never have a chain explosion that is great for your turret's damage resilience. Basically, the only two things that can absolutely kill the turret at this point are the uh, firing piece itself and the turret block itself, which is kind of buried under here under all this. So uh, yeah, uh, definitely spread these out. Definitely attach all of these to autoloaders because the autoloaders present such a huge benefit in terms of the efficiency of each individual component. Now, as far as the ammo boxes themselves, what these do is they basically just pack more ammo into the shell. Uh, the more of these you have, and the more autoloaders you have them connected to, the faster the uh, shell will reload, essentially. That's, that's really their only purpose. If you have a good firing rate already, you don't need more of these things. Uh, they're just there for that. Uh, and since they're explosive and they don't provide any other benefits, unlike these pellets, if you reach a firing rate you're happy with, adding more pellets is almost always better. So yeah, limit these to what you need. Uh, autoloaders have two different uh, variants of them. There's a manual and an auto autoloader. Now, I tend to not like the auto autoloaders. Uh, I definitely like the manual ones a lot more just because of how easy it is to play with the manual ones and the precision with which you can place them. The auto autoloaders will attempt to orient themselves correctly, but they're kind of dumb about it, so just stick with the manual ones in most cases. You'll be happier. So the way these autoloaders work, I'm going to stick one down on the ground here. Uh, you have these little hatch things on the sides, and sorry for the red highlighting, it's difficult to get rid of that when you're talking about cannons. Uh, so I've got these hatches here. Each of these hatches represents one box or pellet connection point. And so you want to connect as many pellets and boxes to these hatches as you can, and you want to connect as many autoloaders to each box as you can. That leads to a pretty well-defined set of Tetris that you can play, uh, and you can see some examples of that in these things that I've built over here. So I will leave that out for now, but uh, the other sides of this can be connected to six-way connectors, and that is how you connect those to the cannon. The other components we've got here, there is a predictor. This is pretty much useless. Uh, you, and you, you don't really need these. It basically shows a line where the shell is going to go. There's also an interface screen. This lets you interact with the firing piece without being able to see it. It's not really all that special. I don't really see a whole lot of use in these. Uh, you've also got a laser targeter. These let you uh, fuse shells more precisely for timed and altitude detonation. And you've got a fusing box. Now the fusing box is super useful, so let's go ahead and take a look at that. We've got one up on this cannon here. In fact, it's attached to the six-way connector. And the firing box, or the fusing box here, gives us a bunch of different fuse check boxes. Now each of these will use up 0.25 volume. That is a constant. Uh, if you add more of these fuses in here, 0.25 each. So the larger your shell is, the less space each individual fuse takes up on that. And the rest of the volume is huge in comparison. So uh, really, you're getting a great amount of value for in adding fuses to cram cannons. There is never a situation in which I would not recommend adding a fuse to a cram cannon unless for some bizarre reason you're doing an EMP only or um, armor piercing only cram cannon shell, which by the way, that's, those, those are bad ideas. Don't do that. And I'm afraid it got a little buried under these barrels, but there is a laser targeter under here and those have a couple settings as well. You can set the offset time so you can have these explode before or after the target. Uh, negative is before, positive is after. You've also got an offset altitude so you can have it explode above or below the target. 
And you've also got a safety distance here that makes sure that the shell will not explode within a certain distance of your vehicle. This 50 meters is barely sufficient for a fully packed cram cannon, which should suffice to show you exactly how lethal an explosive packed cram shell can be. So that's really all there is to a basic cram cannon. Uh, those, those are all the components. And let's go ahead and start taking a look at some demos. So first off, we've got this very large cram cannon here. This one is kind of a battleship style cannon. Uh, normally you try and pack a few more barrels onto one of these things, but I wanted to kind of make a point and try and show you how large these can get. Uh, with the 45 gauge increasers on this thing, and the amount of Tetris that's going into this. This is an extremely powerful cannon. Uh, you can see here the firepower on it is listed 12.25, which is kind of ridiculous. Um, yeah, these are extremely potent cannons. Now, as powerful as cram cannons are, they come with a set of drawbacks. The shells are painfully slow. 200 meters a second is considered a good shell speed. There are vehicles that can almost outrun that. So you've got to be very careful in what you have these things targeting. You need to be very careful in how you set up your local weapon controllers in order to try and avoid targeting fast things. You also need to avoid targeting far things, because even though they might not be moving quickly, even a little bit of velocity adjustment is more than enough to throw off the aim of these cannons. So you've got to be very careful about what sorts of things you aim at in general. And that leads to my primary kind of dislike of these cannons. I'm not a huge fan of cram cannons and I haven't used them a whole lot simply because they're hard to hit things with. You've got a massively bulky cannon that's very unwieldy and the barrels turn extremely slowly and then you can't get them to fire a fast shell so you can't have them hit agile targets at all. If you are shooting at uh, say, a battleship that's not moving very quickly, if you're shooting at a land base that's not moving at all, sure, cram cannons are great because they're the most ammo-efficient way of destroying that thing. Outside of that type of scenario, I've not found a great use for these. But let's go ahead and do some demonstrations here. So I've got, first off, this uh, cram cannon over here is set on channel 1. So I'm going to pick that over here. And we're going to spawn in, let's go for a Marauder. It's a nice standard vehicle. We turn, we lift the barrels agonizingly slowly. And whoops, oh no, we missed the first shot. Well, guess we're waiting about 20 seconds for the next one to hit. <laughs> so uh, this conning tower did not quite lock onto the target as quickly as we would have liked. And it just takes a while for the next shell to fire. When it does fire, it does great damage. It just tore a hole inside of that vehicle. It sent EMP squirting through half the vehicle. It tore the electronics out of the front half of it uh, with the EMP. It's, it just did a huge amount of damage. But at the same time, it's not a very fast firing deal. And if I was to try and aim this at an aircraft, it would not work very well. Uh, in fact, let me go ahead and remove this. And I will spawn in a deep water guard airplane. All right, so I've spawned in a Shrike here. You can see it flying overhead. And we've got our cram cannon down here ready to go. And you can see it is aiming, aiming. It's, it's, it's trying to elevate the barrels. They're going up very slowly, very slowly. We'll get there one of these days. And nope, don't have enough elevation. So that's another problem here. I just don't have enough elevation on my barrels. Uh, let's go ahead and add a few more motor-driven barrels just so that I can get some elevation, uh, preferably after I get this thing to rotate back around. All right, so I've added a few more motor-driven barrels. We've got the Shrike coming back around for another pass. We've got the gun air elevating, elevating. Oh no, it's closing, closing the angle faster than we can elevate the barrel. That's gonna be a problem, yeah. And we lost it. So you run into this problem with cram cannons where if you're trying to hit aircraft, they can just fly over you before the gun barrel can even get the proper elevation if they try and stay close in. Now, if they try and stay far away from you, you've got a chance. But generally speaking, this is the weakness of cram cannons. And this is why I don't like using them as main weaponry. Now, uh, they're just not 
they just don't have quite have the versatility that I like to see. At, this is for later demonstration. We will be seeing more of that vehicle later. Uh, so this cannon is now elevating. It's elevating. We've got another flyby happening. Uh, are we going to get there? Are we going to make it? Uh, it doesn't look like it. No. So we would never be able to hit this vehicle if we were just mounting this cannon. Yeah, it would never happen unless we completely cleared the deck and let this thing rotate 360 degrees, at which point it might be able to elevate the gun barrel enough to actually get hit off. So let's go ahead and remove the uh, enemy here, and I'll go ahead and show you the next demonstration. All right, so the next thing up is these cram mortars. This is kind of a tileable design I've come up with. It's nothing particularly special, but it does a decent chunk of damage per shell, and you can pack, you know, you can pack them in pretty tightly. And they do have the full uh, complement of 45 gauge increasers, so these do get up to the full uh, 2 meter shell. Uh, so let's go ahead and spawn in a nice little marauder here, and we will get that going. These have much less problem with the angle that they have to fire at simply because they don't have to turn as far. These mortars are, generally speaking, not going to have to aim the barrel nearly as much as a regular gun, even if they're firing at aircraft. Uh, because they're firing on this high arc, the shells are going to fire up, over, down, and then they're going to try and hit the top of the deck. Now, the way I fuse these shells, these have, go off at sea level, so I'm never going to hit anything below sea level, but I have the potential of doing things like this to boats. One shot, and this is dead. I don't even need the follow-up shells that are about to hit. So, yeah, these are absolutely devastating when they hit. Uh, however, even a tiny amount of velocity is enough to keep these from hitting in some circumstances. More specifically, a tiny amount of change of velocity. Because these shells are slow at the top of their peak, they start uh, trying to predict the enemy's movement uh, too far in advance a lot of the time. Like these right here are thinking, I'm going eh, maybe 50 meters a second, and they're starting to aim downwards, so they try and predict too far in advance. And very often you'll run into scenarios where they just miss. That's not what you want. Uh, so, especially on something that reloads this slowly, that's very expensive. But and things that don't move quickly, like these v uh, ships, and that don't move around a lot or change velocity a lot, these shells are accurate enough, and they will deal a tremendous amount of damage when they do hit. So mortars I can see being very useful, especially since they have a relatively low amount of barrel traverse. Uh, this type of turret over here, if I switch to this turret, it will... Sorry for the close-up explosions there. This will absolutely destroy the ship it will deal a tremendous amount of damage. It just blew a ton of blocks off the front of that ship. It blew a hole straight through into that front component, compartment. rather. It's just not that great. I mean, uh, there are so many other things that can do similar amounts of damage per second in the same amount of time. And yeah, I just don't see a whole lot of reason to use it that way, especially not when you've got mortars. And especially our third option, which we will look at now. So our third type of cram cannon, and this is my personal favorite, and this is actually the one place I will use cram cannons over literally anything else. This is a bomber, and what I've got here is these bomb chutes, and I've just got a cram cannon built into the top of my vehicle, and that's really all there is to it. I've got four of these things. This will absolutely demolish almost any surface-based vehicle, and the reason for that is these will drop with perfect accuracy, they have a little bit of tracking because they're, you know, technically a high arc shell. And, uh, well, even if they don't get that tracking, being fired with perfect accuracy and reasonably close to the target means that the target will have very little time to maneuver. And even if they do maneuver some, with the low travel time and a high enough explosion radius, they're going to get clipped anyway. These are extremely easy to fuse, they're easy to use the laser targeter with, and they're easy to build. There is no downside to these. All right, so let's go ahead and take a look at this cram bomber in action. I'm going to spawn in the bastion here, 
And that's just going to pop up right there. And it's going to go ahead and start firing away at the platform while our bomber turns to face it. And it looks like, yeah, we're just going to go ahead and fire off a few shells. And instantly we are punching huge holes in this bastion. Uh, you can afford to go with straight HE shells, or you can mix in a bit of frag with bombs. You generally don't want to mix in EMP or armor piercing because the shells aren't going to have enough velocity to guarantee hits. Uh, you want something that you can uh, fuse to explode below a certain altitude if it's going to miss. So uh, you can still salvage some damage out of the shell. That being said, these shells don't miss all that often. They don't require a ton of uh, aiming. They have a very high hit rate, even against things that are moving around a bit on you. And they have a ton of punch. Now, the reason I like these above any other type of weapon, specifically for bombers, is that these have a very interesting reload pattern. Because cram cannons continue to pack more and more damage and more and more uh, components into a shell, uh, even after they've reloaded to the point of being able to fire, you have no DPS downtime on these things. And that's very unique for a bomber. Normally, if you think about missile-based bombs, there's going to be some downtime there, right? You're going to be flying away, and your bombs might reload when you're 75% of the way out to your maximum uh, bombing run distance. And then you can turn back in, and your missiles have already reloaded. At that point, your reload rate is not being used, and that's not very efficient. Uh, these, on the other hand, will continue packing explosive damage in here. You can see the explosive damage going up. They'll continue to pack that in up until they reach a cap, and that cap takes a lot of time to reach. So if I was to spawn in, uh, let's throw in a cauldron right now and this is a little bit heavier of a vehicle. You can see that occasionally these bombs will, for no reason apparently, fire into the ground, and that's a little bit annoying. Uh, I haven't figured out exactly why they do that, but you could probably avoid that with some clever limitations on your uh, AI. So this is going to come over here, it's going to drop some shells. You can see those that lambs had absolutely no chance of stopping those shells, and we blew at least a little bit of a hole into this thing's surface. Now, if we give this thing full time to pack and come around for another run, it's going to blow a much larger hole in. I've made our vehicle invulnerable so we don't get blown out of the sky here. Uh, so, let's just watch this come in. We've got a very slow bomber here because of the amount of weight it's carrying. That's one thing you do have to contend with. You're going to need a lot of thrust on this in order to make it accelerate quickly. All right, so we've got a bomb run coming in here. This should fire shortly. There we go. And we've got four huge bombs land right on top of that turret, and they just completely demolish that turret. It no longer exists. That is extremely useful. So yeah, that's what crown bombers are for. So that's it for crime shells. I hope you've enjoyed this tutorial. Hope you've learned something. And if you have any recommendations or other information to add, please feel free to share it in the comments. Like I've said, cram shells are, and cram cannons are not my area of expertise. These are by no means my favorite weapon in the game due to the reasons I've mentioned, but they have their role. And I will definitely use them on any craft that I have making bombing runs. So yeah, that's all for today, and I hope I'll see you next time.